Hey there, it's Joe Buccino, host of the 18th Airborne Corps podcast. Our mini-series on Operation Market Garden continues. This is a grand, bold, ambitious, sweeping mini-series. It's as big and ambitious as Market Garden itself. Hopefully more successful. We were originally going to do nine episodes over nine days in concert with the 77th anniversary of Market Garden. So we were going to go 17th September to 24th September. However, in the telling of the story, we realized we needed more episodes. So we added two more. 11 episodes over 11 days. This is episode 71. In this episode, we are going to talk about the Polish airborne unit that jumped into Operation Market Garden and fought in Arnhem. This episode is hosted by Matt Visser, who works on the show, does research on the show, and sometimes is a voice on the show. Matt, thanks for doing this. Who did you talk to? Who was the guest here? So my guest on the show is Jennifer Grant. She's a researcher and scholar who covers the Polish forces. Mm -hmm. Uh, She researches at Queen Mary University out of London, and she lends her voice to talking about 1st Independent Parachute Brigade. You know, she's such a great uh, historian. She's a voice on, on a lot of the World War II podcasts and YouTube channels that really cover Market Garden. And uh, she, you already talked to her. She did a wonderful job kind of laying this out. Yeah. So this is my discussion with Jennifer. Excellent. All right. Thanks so much, Matt. Broadcasting from the center of the military universe, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, this is the 18th Airborne Corps Podcast the official podcast of America's Contingency Corps. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, One of the areas that when going through the podcast that we really failed to focus on, and I think it's one of the areas that when you look and examine Market Garden, it's also left by the wayside, is the Polish role. So uh, one one of the leaders that's heavily criticized is the Polish general, Stanislaw Sosabowski. Um, He goes into Market Garden as a hero for the Poles, having um, a decorated career of service in the military. He's the commander of the 1st Independent Parachute Brigade during Market Garden. Um, But I think that from what I've heard, there's lots of, and from what I've read, there's a lot of serious concerns and opposition on how he's been viewed as a leader And it differs among countries. So I wanted to hear your perspective on his role and then how people have interpreted his role over time since. Yeah, I mean, it's it's essentially it's it's quite messy. Um, So the Independent Polish Parachute Brigade is is formed um, primarily uh, to provide support to occupied Poland. Uh, The idea that they would be dropped in and provide support for an upcoming uprising. Um, And this is why it's the only um, Polish unit operating um, in the UK um, that is entirely under Polish command. Um, And that changes to get into sort of 1944, um, when there's a sort of bit of a debate, the British really want to sort of bring this this brigade under uh, British command um, for the upcoming sort of Northwest Europe campaign. Um, And Sosabowski, who's kind of been dealing with men such as Browning um, on Mm. a sort of position of equality, is now under command. So you've got that sort of shift in the dynamics of their relationship and and so forth. Um, But yes, it's it's kind of this this elite group that has been um, sort of training on Scottish soil primarily. And it's made up of sort of remnants of the the Polish army that's managed to escape both from Poland into France and then make it to Britain. Um, Then you've got kind of volunteers who may have done military service, but aren't, you know, sort of professional soldiers. You've got volunteers from America, from Canada, South America. Um, And then you've got groups of Poles who've arrived from the Middle East after being part of the Siberian deportation. Um, And he puts them through these two weeks of intense training. Uh, The Poles kind of develop their own um, system of training their men, partly because they don't have the easy access to the planes that the the British do. Um, So they have, for example, um, jump towers. I mean, pre-war Poland has more parachute towers than Britain does. And I, I'm not sure Britain even has any. Um, and so they're sort of developing their own sort of PT schedule, they're developing their own training schedule and so forth. So they're, they're absolutely sort of um, cutting edge in terms of their sort of training and preparation. I mean, Sosabowski comes over to America to look at how um, sort of the, the tactics work. 
um, in terms of, you know, the, the massed formations of, of parachute drops. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're kind of ready to go, but with the assumption not that they would be ready for, for uh, you know, they protest continuously about being used in European operations that aren't focused specifically on Poland. Um, so we kind of then get this haggling in the middle of 1944, uh, where the Polish authorities hand over control um, to uh, of, of this brigade to the British, um, mm -hmm. and it's then part of um, Operation Market Garden. And mm -hmm. one of the limitations you just vocalized was on aircraft accessibility, but an airfield was one of the constraints imposed on the Polish brigade for Sozabowski as well in leading to the decision or what culminated with the Poles being under the command of the Brits, to my understanding. Is that accurate? Yeah, well, it's, um, I mean, the Brits particularly, I mean, you've got this dilemma of all the exiled armies, you know, because it's not just the Poles, it's the Czechs, the Norwegians, Yugoslavia, and so forth, mm. is that although they, you know, maintain this position of national sovereignty, they are in a position of dependency um, on, on the British primarily um, for mm -hmm. resources. And that's never more true than when you're talking about sort of paratroopers. Um, so um, they do get access to RAF Ringway. They do lots and lots of training sort of um, uh, drops from the sort of barrage balloons and, and the Whitleys and, and so forth. Um, and certainly once they come under British command and the sort of Sosabowski establishes a better relationship, 43, 44, um, they have access to more training. So they're doing training over Salisbury Plain, for example. Um, but it is that, that, that sort of shortage of the plane. And I think also at heart is the fact that the Poles are coming into a Britain that's relatively xenophobic, that has this sense mm. of effortless superiority. Um, there's a sort of throwaway phrase that they assume that all foreigners were either mad or incompetent. Um, so you've got all of these sort of factors in the relationship okay. that Poles are this exotic, albeit quite useful um, unit that's being brought on board. And so then for Market Garden, um, th as the Poles are now employed, they're, they fall under the Brits' command. Um, the brigade is essentially dispersed. It's not operating as an organic unit. So a component of the brigade arrives by glider on the 18th of September. And then the actual paras parachute section that jumps in is the 21st of September. And one of one of the big... Um, that's viewed as one of the failures. And part of that is because Browning ordered this and they're arriving within seven kilometers from Arnhem Bridge, the Arnhem Bridge. So it, would you say that the, I guess, would you say that the responsibility is with Browning? Um, I mean, certainly, if you read Sosabos's memoirs, I mean, he has no control over whether those planes take off on that day at all. Um, mm. One of the big things he comes out fighting for is he doesn't understand why, even in the original plan, um, it was supposed to be sort of 72 hours with these great big gaps between the, the three drops that were envisaged. He says you could have turned it around within 36. Um, mm. So from his perspective, that's out of his hands. Um and then obviously when they actually get onto the ground, the, the, the brigade is split. Um, some, are, the, the, you know, the first group are on the north of the river and the other um, two sections are to the south of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, his big complaint is then that, you know, they were promised um, these boats to get across. Um, so the, the big tension is why the Poles aren't able to sort of make this difference to actually move across the Rhine and that actually sort of, you know, make this significant difference. Um, but that's not really the reason quoted for why he's then um, the British War Office after Market Garden fails um, lobbies for him to be removed. They, they say it's right. because they work with him. It's a personality element um, as both, you know, um, and it never really falls on, on the polls. But yes, it's kind of this division between who's responsible for what element of, of the plan. Um, and certainly when he gets a reputation for, for questioning um, elements of the plan and saying it's unworkable. Um, mm. But then obviously when it's proved to be correct, he's still the fall guy in this scenario. And that's because of the power dynamic, I suppose, from that the, the British army has. And Churchill, Winston Churchill, is behind some of these statements in aligning the criticism to Sazabowski. Yeah. And so, and what we see unfold. Um, and the memoir that you referenced is I Freely Served, one of the two memoirs that he 
authored. Um, but he, he sees an attrition of around 40% of his brigade in Market Garden. And then part of the criticism, he, he becomes the fall guy, whether he should have been or not. And it's very, this is a very complicated topic. And there are scholars all over with numer numerous perspectives, and it's difficult to get the comprehensive understanding. Uh, but it results, you know, for the listeners, it results with his uh, removal of command uh, by the yeah. Polish general staff in late December of 44. Um, would, so he, he ends up, he ends up leaving the military. I think he gets another assignment after this within the military, he leaves, he becomes a factory worker and lives for the rest of his life um, in Acton, which is outside of London. Um, but so one that, of the I things, mean, yeah, please. I mean, yeah. I was just jump in. I mean, that's not tied to the success or failure of his military career. I mean, you have mm. men such as Anders or, or Maciek who have covered their careers in glory. It's mm. the role that the Poles find themselves in in Britain after the war. They're unable to return to to communist occupied um, Russia. Um, and although the Brits reach out and say that they're willing to, you know, sort of provide sanctuary effectively for this. I mean, originally it's a quarter of a million Poles, um, uh, only about half of them then stay in the UK. But the expectation is that they won't be in competition um, with British workers, which is why you find, you know, Maciek's a barman in Edinburgh, for example. I mean, my grandfather, who's captain of the Polish army, is working in a mill in Bradford. Um, mm. So it wasn't tied to the, the shame of, of this event. Um, and okay. certainly within the Polish community, um, he's sort of... Um, you know, he's very much seen as having been uh, betrayed by 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 the British. Um, yeah, as you say, he's he's, he's working this sort of um, you know factory grounds um, uh, in Acton, and, so, and then he dies. Mm. So it's not un it's not uncommon. It's not seen by the poles as. Um, I mean, obviously, factory workers are incredibly productive citizens, mm. and we need them as well. It's a di a different time. So perhaps looking at that now, we see him going from an esteemed general in the Polish military to working at a factory, we may come to conclusions, but the, you're, you say these conclusions may be inaccurate. Yeah, uh, I mean, absolutely. It, it's not, you know, um, there is a huge drop in status. So if you'd flown with, for example, um, the Air Force, there's a huge demand after the war. You've got, you know, civilian airlines picking up again. You've got, you know, breakdowns of empires, you've got each country sort of developing. So there are vacancies for highly trained engineers and pilots. But if you were part of the, the infantry, um, if you're part of the, the army or indeed the Navy, there aren't really any roles for you that are concomitant with, you know, the status you had achieved. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. Machex having... Uh, for example, or Anders, they have been associating with, you know, they meet Churchill, they meet Alan Brooke, they meet, uh, you know, Alexander, all of these, you know, um, Clark in, in Italy, they have been associating with that level. And then when they get there, they're, you know, the men in their sort of 50s, um, they don't have qualifications relevant to Britain. What do they do that they, they take on whatever jobs that they're able to do to sort of support their families? It's, it's I mean, it is a, a tragedy. Um, but yeah, in Sosbosti's case, it's not that he's been singled out in that sense. That was the standard fate for these senior Polish generals um, after the war. Yeah, it's it's difficult when you look back. And I, I mean, they've received the accolades. The unit has the brigade has received accolades since. Um, Allies have acknowledged the role that the the his, that his brigade played in this operation. They were given one of the most difficult tasks. So we see Operation Market Garden as a, as a failure. Um, but there are so many different contenders that were a part of that, and the plan was made in less than eighteen hours. And there were numerous plans that could have been chosen from this particular general officer. He vocalized vehemently his opposition to the plan. He asked for another uh, Polish brigade, but he asked for another Polish brigade to assist on the operation. Um, wow. Yeah, and the thing is, I mean, Sosbowski, I mean, he he comes out swinging from this as well. Um, you know, sort of, um, he um, almost immediately, um, he releases, you know, Freely I Serve comes out in 1960. So we're only talking, you know, just over 10 years after the end of the war. Um, mm -hmm. And he's responding to other memoirs written by um, 
you know, sort of British generals and, and so forth, and Montgomery's assessment, Urquhart's assessment and so forth. And he absolutely sets it out. He says, you know, the, you know, the, starts at the top with the relationship between Montgomery and Eisenhower. He's talking yeah, about, as yeah. you say, you know, this is turned around in 18 hours. And it's it's what, you know, the fifth, sixth um, operation that, that, that was planned, all of which had failed. So they're actually going into this, not even thinking that this is the one that's actually going to stick this time. Um, and then he's talking down on the ground. He's talking about sort of a lack of urgency on the part of the British. And um, so he's laying this all out, um, which is kind of why um, when he, I mean, he dies in 1967, um, but when they then make, you know, the, the classic film, um, A Bridge Too Far, um, and he's, um, you know, his character is pretty much, I, I think, in line with how he would wish to be remembered, that from the outset, mm. um, he's saying this, this is problematic. Um, so in that sense, he's kind of breaks through um, with his own narrative um, into sort of British consciousness, which is, is quite a triumph, I think, for him. I've heard that there's lots of criticism of his his role within the, the film. It's interesting that your assessment is that he sees that as a fairly accurate depiction of, of his role. Uh, yeah, I mean, at the point, you know, he, he's been dead for 10 years when it's released, but they, they consult sure. his family and the family sort of, approve of this um mm. and, you know i'm always a little bit wary about you know sort of family and and, and history and, and the overlap between them um but yeah in, in that sense you read his book i mean he is absolutely forthright and and he starts off you know his introduction was about him um receiving this promotion and then have been taken to the side and being told um you know but you need to learn to watch your tongue you can't just keep challenging senior officers and he's like well that's how i understand command is that you know if you're a good leader then you take these criticisms on board um and he never really modifies that and then you know as i say when he's dismissed it's on the grounds that you know the british cannot work with him um and then he's talking about his relationship with um i can't remember quite if it's, it's browning or urquhart and he's saying that i think it's urquhart he's saying that you know they had this conversation and he, he was quite brusque with him this is while you know during operation mark garden um and the urquhart you know was was quite short with him and he should have really taken into consideration sosabovsky's character and, and what he's like so mm. um there, there really is this sort of personality tension power dynamic as and well cultural. as well. sorry go on. and and a cultural one as well how we communicate has you know there are cultural implications there that could have been uh involved yeah, as well that's absolutely fascinating isn't it i mean because you've got i mean you've got a very basic level you've, you've got sort of different language um um, so, I mean, Sosbosky's English is, is pretty good, but you've also got the distance with interpreters, for example. You've got, mm -hmm. you know, what are the preconceptions that the Brits bring to the polls? And certainly, um, you know, the assumption is they, you know, were defeated relatively rapidly in September 1939. What could they possibly have to offer? There must be inherent failures in their military, in their training, in their, their morale and, and, and doctrine and so forth. Um, so, Although, you know, they've had sort of four and a half years really to get to know each other. Um, and sosbovsky has got very good relationships with uh, a lot, you know, Morris Newnham, for example, who's sort of in charge of developing the airborne force in Britain. Um, yeah, you kind of, you see that again when you get to the, the Poles in, in Normandy, in the first Polish armoured division, um, where they have to communicate in French. And then there's Montgomery expecting the Poles to show more flair and this kind of idea that they have at heart this sort of cavalry mentality that they were taken to battle and um, which on the one hand is you know sort of admiring this sort of military prowess but also it's it's tiny back to a slightly sort of archaic um sort of approach to to battle um so yeah you've got loads and loads of, sort of cultural differences and a lot of it's having to be negotiated on the ground when they arrive you know what uniform do they wear? What drill do they practice? Access to mm -hmm. training grounds and so forth. It's, it's all really, really sort of, um, it's fascinating. Definitely is. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer Grant. We really appreciate you coming on the show and giving the Polish perspective on this. Um, definitely will round out our series on Market Garden. So thank you so much for joining us. Not at all. Thank you for asking me. That was my discussion with Jennifer Grant. This was the ninth installment of 11 episodes covering Operation Market Garden. Tune in. We have two more episodes in the Operation Market Garden series. This is Matt Visser co-hosting with Joe Buccino. Thanks for listening to the 18th Airborne Corps podcast. 
We'll continue to produce great content for you. Be sure to like and subscribe to the 18th Airborne Corps podcast. Give us five stars. We appreciate your listenership all the way.